So um, you, you're just back from Palm Springs where they did a little number last night. Um, did you think this movie was going to be received the way it was? You know, I think we knew we had made a movie that was, you know, had some weight to it and, you know, was important for the times we live in. I think our one concern was that it's a different kind of movie. You know, we really took some leaps. We, we broke the number one rule of filmmaking, which is show, don't tell. Right. Uh, by breaking the fourth wall. So I was curious how kind of the more traditional formalists would respond to that and, and what our response would be. But I always had a lot of faith in how it would play for audiences. And that's really what it was built to do. So Well, they changed the date at some point. So talk about the process of that decision. Well, that was, you know, that's a testament to my editor, Hank Corwin, when he delivered the rough editor's cut, which, you know, usually is a mess. I actually watched it and thought, wow, this is pretty darn good. And so he and I did about two or three weeks of re-editing on it and did a little screening for about 20 friends. And I was like, this is crazy. We're like three steps ahead of where I normally am. And that's when I called the studio and I said, I think you might have this ready sooner rather than later. Like, usually with movies you like miss something or there's a part you have to reshoot or... Or you want to kill yourself. Or you want to kill yourself. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in this case, we just, we, you know, I think it helped that we had vetted the script so much. So by the time we came in, we had a script we were really solid on. And, uh, well, what you were doing was a tall order. You were trying to do something very dense and very hard to ingest. And I'm, I'm fascinated by how long that script must have taken to get into shape. What, what did, how long did it take? It was probably a process. I think I wrote the first draft in like two months, and then there were about three or four other drafts, and I have like a little group of five people that I trust, including my wife. And then Plan B gives really smart notes. And Plan B was like right away excited by it. Like when I had the break in the fourth wall and the explainers, they were like, they loved it. Um, so Where was the question of your ability to direct this, which seems, seems to be, where, where did those questions come from? You know, I, it's funny, it never really came up. It, uh, I thought it would, but when I went to Plan B and told them my perspective on the movie and what I thought it should be, they right away were thrilled and excited. And it's a credit to them. I think there's a lot of production companies that would think, oh, he's a comedy guy. He can't do this, but Plan B is not like that. They they sort of get the larger picture of what you're doing, and and Jeremy Kleiner and Dee Dee Gardner had always talked to me about like you know the political undertones of our silly comedies, and they knew that I'd written for Huffington Post and had done the Broadway show with Farrell about Bush, and so they were aware of kind of my activist or not activist, but my the fact that I cared about politics and the world and issues. Um, so they didn't even blink. And once they vouched for me, I was good. And then also I've done a bunch of movies with Paramount. We've always had a great relationship. We've had hits, too. Yeah, yeah. We've but on the comedy side. On the comedy side, yeah. But that's an asset here. Your yes. ability to entertain yeah. was terribly important. It Imagine had... what this would have been if it had been, like, oh. super serious, right? It's funny. I knew right away this couldn't be Syriana. Uh, you know, Syriana can be Syriana. It's a great movie, but for this story, it couldn't be that, and it couldn't be The Insider. Um, so, we always talked about the fact this has to be a populist movie. It, it just has to. It has to connect with the audience, otherwise there's no point in making it. And I think that's a lot of the way that Michael Lewis writes, too. I think he writes in a populist vein. He's a great storyteller. He knows how to engage a reader, and we were sort of inspired by that. He creates from real life, of course, mm -hmm. incredible characters. Oh yeah, always. So there was some earlier version of this where they were going to do a, a more composite kind of thing with only two characters. You ended up making the spotlight decision. Yeah. That you were gonna go with the real folks. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it had to be. I, I felt like the real people are so specific, so engaging. And then especially when I met with the real people and I saw their how, they, how conflicted they were, how they were sort of in pain about what had happened, even though they had made a lot of money. And for each of them, it was like they were told there was no Santa Claus when they were nine years old. They couldn't believe how corrupt the market was. And I love that. I thought that was incredible. And that's kind of the heart of the movie, really, is a bunch of people that believed in the market who then saw that it had been captured or corrupted. And also, that was your um, populist hook. 
Yes. Because you believe that the audience wants to know about this. Yeah, and I believe... How they were screwed. <laughs> yeah, oh God, yeah. And I believe that most people didn't know, like me, before I started reading about this. We all just had a general sense that a housing bubble had collapsed and something had happened. And we kind of knew the banks were behind it, but it was all very vague. So that was the other big decision, was to bear down on the specifics, to not shy away from the jargon, to go... To basically say to the audience, we think you can handle this. And they put a lot of effort into making this sound confusing and boring, but it's not, you know. And that, that was probably the biggest choice we made, I think. Absolutely. So that choice included what you re referenced before, breaking the wall with Margot Robbie. You know, incredible decision. Knowing that people know the rules. Yeah. They know the rules. Why did you think, did you think that the internet gave you permission to get away with this? It's in a weird it's way? A really interesting question. Yes, I do. I think the fact that people are so inundated with media now and that everyone is so savvy, I don't think you could have done what we did 40 years ago, 30 years ago. It would have been jarring and off putting. Two years ago, three years you ago. You might be right. You might be right. I mean, the one movie I always looked at was 24 Hour Party People, but that wasn't a big hit. But I thought it was really good, and, I, and I, what I noticed about that movie was when Winterbottom would break the fourth wall, it had an energy and a playfulness to it that I was like, oh, that's interesting. And we had done it in theater back in the 90s in Chicago, too. We had played with Breaking the Fourth Wall, so I had always been a fan of it, but I think you're 100% right. I think maybe even three, four years ago it wouldn't have worked, but the, we're, we're just in a media bath right now. I mean, you can talk about someone in North Dakota, and they understand the idea of breaking the fourth wall. And, I think you have an instinct also that the audience requires a certain authenticity now. Mm -hmm. So on some weird level, what you're saying, and I love this decision that you made, is I'm not faking this for you. Yeah. I'm giving you the real thing, and when I fake it, I'm going to tell you. Yeah. I yeah. love that you did that. That was one of my favorite things. I love that we got to keep in the moment where Finn Whitrock says this didn't really happen. and because we really were trying to give them the true story. and But there were times with the script where you have to combine scenes. And I thought, how cool to just have someone tell you that, you know? And even though it says based on a true story at the top, everyone walks out of the theater going, that is a true story. And we, we had to say based on a true story because some names changed. And so was like, there was one key character who did not want his name used. Do you want yeah. to tell, tell us about that? Uh, well, there were a few. I mean, uh, obviously anyone who didn't come off well didn't want their name in it. We were play with that, but it was uh, Steve Carell's character had a family tragedy, and the tragedy was so awful that the family asked me not to put it in the movie, so I had to fictionalize the tragedy, and that was it. That was the only thing I did for that story that wasn't completely true, um, so we changed his name, because uh, it involved his brother dying, and he didn't have a brother that died, so, and then the other one was Gosling's character, he's not really doing the real guy. He's kind of like, took the real guy as an inspiration and leapt off. And we felt like, well, that's unfair to the real guy to like have Gosling doing this crazy character and it's not like the guy, he has a family and stuff, so we changed his name as well. But on the other hand, the other, as I understand it, the other actors, especially Christian Bale, really dug into the real oh, person. Yeah. He channeled him, right? Well, he spent, he went up to Northern California and spent like 15 hours with the real guy in a room, just the two of them. And he got the guy's real clothes, he got the guy's shoes, he got everything. And then he learned to play drums like the real guy. And it was amazing. And Carell really did that too. Carell really met with the Steve Eisman, the real person, really channeled him in a specific way. I'd say Jeremy Strong did that as well. I mean, he's really, if you meet the real Vinny, it's exactly like what Jeremy's doing in the movie. Um, and then some people were looser. I, I think uh, John Majero and Finn Whitrock are kind of doing their guys, but Pitts kind of took a leap off of his guy. It's a little bit different. And so I kind of just, with each actor, we just tried to figure out what was best. You landed an amazing cast. Oh, yeah. So the script must have pulled them. They liked the script. I think it was a mixture of kind of the, you know, the bold choices of the script with the weight of the story. I mean, this is clearly one of the five big stories of the last 50 years. And I think that combination definitely pulled them in. And then we had some great conversations with the actors, too. We would talk about how I wanted to do it. And they all just were excited by this approach that we were doing. They knew it was unique. 
So talk about the actual filming, because one of the things, you have a great DP, but you made a decision that was conscious, must have been, that you were going to go scruffy, if you yeah. like. Oh, yeah. So, so, you know, you know the Academy, you know what they're like. I mean, <laughs> they want gloss, you know, yeah. at least some of them do. And now, I, explain the aesthetic decisions here. I would say this folds into the idea of breaking the fourth wall, where audiences are now sophisticated enough that they can handle this. And I, I've been tracking Barry Ackroyd for years, our DP, I'm a huge fan of his. And I just felt like this Wall Street story... The Hurt Locker. Uh, Hurt Locker, Captain Phillips, United 93, which I think Incredible. is a masterpiece. Yeah. And I love his style. And what I've always noticed about it is it is messy. It's human, but it's so engaging. And I didn't want this movie to be austere. I didn't want it to have locked down wide shots. I didn't want everyone to look perfect because these aren't those guys. These are the guys that had pit stains. These are the guys who couldn't make eye contact in a meeting in the case of Dr. Burry. And I wanted you to feel their anxiety and excitement, and I wanted each moment to be, and especially because the whole system is off the rails, I wanted it to be agitating and engaging. Uh, so we did, we took the bold leap of uh, calling Mr. Ackroyd, um, and I was so happy we did. I mean, he's one of the great living DPs, he's a real artist, and, you know, I, I just didn't want phone call scenes to be in a medium shot with just a guy on a phone, but the way Barry shoots it, you're inside the call, and you can feel everything about it. So he was a key piece of uh, putting this movie together. But then you, go, you get Anthony Bourdain, you know. <laughs> um, um, I mean, these are bold decisions. Uh, you did, and, and it worked. It's Where nice. Is, nice when that so so you, you, he, you just saw the video and said, I'm using this, and you got permission. Uh, for what? For Anthony Bourdain. Anthony the Bourdain. chowder. I had read uh, Kitchen Confidential years ago, and I loved it. And I never forgot his description of seafood stew. So he did this for you? Yeah. yeah. Oh. So I never forgot his description of seafood stew. So I wrote it in the script, but I told the producers, I go, you can't have anyone else do this. Because Bourdain came up with this story, so it has to be him. And he was supposed to fly to Vietnam to, like, you know, go eat scorpions or something. And uh, our producer, Kevin Messick, was able to, like, get him into New York for, like, half a day. And we shot that. And, uh... But yeah, he was key. I felt like we had to have him. And the music. What, tell us what, what your th decisions were there. What, what choices you were making there. What, it, what did it have to accomplish for you? We had two levels of the music. We had one level which was we wanted to reflect pop culture and what Americans were paying attention to. So you were channeling the period. Yeah, the pop kind of white noise that really blasts the American consciousness. And, and that's where you got like the ludicrous video and that's where you got all these little clips and weird mishmashes of sounds. But then on the other hand, we wanted a really beautiful, almost mathematical classical score to underpin the stakes of what's going on and the human part of it to almost contrast the pop sounds of the movie. So we got very lucky. Uh, Plan B recommended this brilliant young composer, uh, Nicholas Bertel, and he came in and just blew us away. And, uh, my favorite piece of his is when everyone's leaving the casino in slow motion, and you see it's like the hangover of the day after Vegas, and he wrote this piece of piano music that is just breathtaking. And then he scores the entire end of the movie, just him, two hands on a piano, and uh, so it was really this odd balance that we found between the sort of the pop, white noise, headache-inducing culture, and then sort of the grace of human beings, like we wanted both of those things to coexist. So the, you know, the risk that you took paid off, but it's terribly important, it seems to me, that the studio system be open oh, yeah. to this kind oh, of risk taking, yeah. because often these movies end up deadly. Yep. So, so what, 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 are, what, going forward, you're going to have a little more leeway. Yeah, I mean, you know, I give a lot of credit to Paramount, you know, to, to uh, Rob Moore, Mark Evans, Brad Gray, like, I mean, Megan Colligan, I mean, they really leapt in with both feet on this and really believed in it in a passionate way. I can tell when a marketing department's just doing their job and when they're into it, and they're really into it. It's really cool, and they love the movie. So as far as studio experiences, I've actually been lucky. I've mostly had great studio experiences. And, um, I, you know, I, it, it was really kind of uh, gave me a lot of hope 
to see a studio get behind something like this and really feel proud about it. And it re what it really reminds you is, uh, is like, yes, a lot of the studios are owned by corporations, but bottom line is people want to do stuff that matters, and you still see that in play with a case like this or 12 Years a Slave or these movies that get made. So as much as the number is the bottom line, there's still room for the other thing. And I also think they've gotten very smart where these awards movies can make money and can really make an impact. And, you know, I was very, knock on wood, I was very happy to see the movie play so well in its first sort of, you know, we released half, like 1,500 screens, and it's been playing really well, so, yeah. The numbers are good. Yeah. So, what's the next uh, project for you? I keep coming back to climate change, but it's so hard to crack. I mean, I, I'm a believer that whatever movie you do, it has to be engaging, exciting, it has to be, it's got to be a movie, it's got to be something you have your popcorn and you're into it. And that's a hard subject, so I'm keeping that around. I have an idea with Will Ferrell about immigrants, uh, two guys who go down to protect our border from the Mexicans and end up having a completely different experience than you think they'd have. Did you see Cartel Land? Uh, I did. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. So, you know, I, I'm in the middle of still getting this movie out and I've learned through the years that whatever I say I'm going to do next usually isn't what I do next, but for sure I'm hooked on this idea of doing stuff that's about now. I think there's no question about that. Yeah. Thank you.